Welcome to another ComCom Virtual 2020 session. This time we're with Natalie Adams from the NHS. Natalie and I used to work together uh, at a company and we've both since moved on, um, but we stay in contact with one another. And when the pandemic hit and then with ComCom Virtual 2020 going on, um, I thought it was vital to get an insight from someone that actually knows what they're talking about when it comes to mental health. So instead of me babbling on at the very beginning, uh, I'm just going to pass it over to Natalie. And then I'm going to catch up with all of you afterwards um, and talk to Natalie about what she says and uh, and some of the ideas uh, and, and, and processes that she comes up with uh, and shares with all of us. So I'll catch you all after she's done talking. Thank you, Natalie, for taking the time. Um, I know you're a very busy person at the moment. Thank you. Great, thanks, Dan. Um, so yeah, my name is Natalie Adams. I work for the National Health Service in the UK, and I actually work in a mental health uh, rehab and learning disabilities trust. Um, outside of work, I'm a mental health first aider and psychological first aider, and I'm an exec coach as well. Um, but uh, just a disclaimer, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I have worked in uh, workplace wellbeing for quite a few years now. So I'm hoping that I can share with you just some, uh, some reflections on, on managing your mental health through COVID so far, but also some really practical things uh, about how to move forward and some things that, that might be helpful uh, if you're experiencing those emotions that, that actually are really normal when we're, when we're going through something like a pandemic, but will feel very uh, unusual to all of us at the moment. So just wanted to, uh, to start off by saying why is, is mental health at work so important? So we spend an average of 90,000 hours of our lives at work. Um, and, and I, like many people, believe that actually that should, uh, your work should not impact negatively on your health. Uh, in fact, it should, it should bring something to your health. Being at work and, and having that meaning in our lives should aid our, our mental and our physical well-being. But, but sometimes that doesn't happen. And there's quite a dangerous narrative that we have around uh, work. So terms like work-life balance, for example, that implication that actually when you're at work, you're not living, life is something that we do outside of work, uh, can, can really not be helpful when, when we think about our own mental well-being. And in lots of the leaders that I speak to and coach, very often considering their mental well-being at work isn't something that they've ever spent any time doing and very much playing into that well you know I do things outside of work to look after myself but actually sometimes it's what we do inside of work in terms of the amount we take on the way we manage our energy the way we manage our time that can have the biggest positive impacts on on how we're feeling Part of my role uh, in whatever I do is to think about how we can support people to be at their best. Um, things that, that we might not uh, normally do have come into play through COVID. So I'm not used to supporting people that are, that are juggling lots of different responsibilities at the same time, home, work, life, all, all happening at the same time from the same place necessarily. So I've had to shift a lot of my own thoughts around how do we really support people to be at their best when they're working through a pandemic. Um, and there's lots of articles, I'm sure everybody's seen lots of things about that, managing your new uh, sort of work-life balance, working from home, for example. Uh, but what this has really meant for me, working in the, in the NHS at the moment, is helping our staff to, to really realign and think about the habits that they have. So the things that they might do from a routine point of view that really help their well-being during a, a stressful situation or a crisis situation. And then the things actually that, that might trigger something very negative. So I think to give you an example, one of the one of the really key themes is, is when you may have had uh, symptoms of COVID yourself or somebody in your family is it's very difficult to make uh, rational, emotional uh, decisions about things when, when you have that real almost threat to life, really, um, that most of us don't ever have to think about when we're at work. It's not a normal thing for us to do outside of maybe the army or, you know, uh, 
situations where you put yourself routinely in danger and that has a big psychological impact so one of the things that that we've looked at really is, is what are the things that help but also what are the triggers for people and where might we see behavior that we don't normally see at work because people are really having to to think about and deal with with a threat if you like that uh, that they've not done before and of course all of this has happened at pace so the the covid pandemic at, at escalated very quickly um, and then guidelines and all sorts of things that we've had to abide by and shift our kind of work and our lives around have been continuously changing throughout so there's not only that the threats but there's also having to constantly refactor and make sense of all the new information that's coming at us as well so to give you a bit of context um, about how uh, i'm doing that and the industry that i'm working in at the moment the National Health Service in the UK is the world's third largest employer, so it's slightly behind the Russian army and the American army, I believe, and employs over 1.5 million people, so it's a huge workforce. Um, and when we think about the baseline of where we were starting from in terms of mental well-being, 38% of NHS staff reported feeling unwell due to work-related stress, and we know that that's been rising over the last few years. And generally, sickness absence and, and stress being a large contributor to that runs 2.3% higher than the rest of the UK economy normally. So if you think about the baseline of, uh, of staff working in the National Health Service, we weren't starting from a great place when it came to mental well-being and the effects of stress. So obviously, COVID has, has added to that and made it even more challenging to think about uh, how we all manage our, our well-being at work. And in terms of the work that uh, I normally do uh, and the NHS trusts that I work for, our health and wellbeing strategy for, for staff really focuses on uh, creating environments where we support ourselves and each other to thrive. And we look at two main things here. Um, we look at the things that people can do to help themselves, the preventative things and some of the practical uh, points I'm going to talk about today. But we also look at what happens when you really need support most. So whether it's physical health, mental health, financial health, uh, psychological health, anything that's impacted on you and your well-being and being able to get the support that you need when you need it most. And we found that looking at things in these two ways has been really beneficial during the pandemic as well. So thinking about the things that we can do and we can support teams to do to manage their own well-being, but also to think about have the things that we've got in place when things aren't going so well fit for purpose. And actually COVID has tested that like never before. So when it comes to things like counselling support, um, creating spaces for people to speak safely about how they're feeling. Actually, we've come into a time where people are really accessing those services uh, more than they ever normally do. And I wanted to share a model with you uh, today before we move into to some of the practical ideas uh, that we've adapted and the NHS at, at large has adapted to think about the different types of well-being support. So well-being is one of those catch-all terms, if you like, that, that covers so many things. Um, but each of the layers of this triangle really add up to, to good mental health uh, and mental well-being support. And the idea of the model is the bottom two sections of that triangle, absolutely everybody needs those to function well, both in work and out of work. Um, so during COVID, from a National Health Service perspective, Basic needs might have meant having access to uh, personal protective equipment, having shifts that are realistic, so not too long, having a chance to rest between those shifts, and very simple things like being able to access food and drink that you may have normally popped out to the shops to buy. And actually, when you're in full PPE, that's just not something you can do. So how are you eating when you're at work and sleep patterns? Uh, but, but that's the same for anybody in the general population. So when you think about your basic needs at work, what do you need? To, it might be that actually you can work from somewhere where you're undisturbed and during the pandemic that's been really hard. It might be that you have some clear boundaries between when work ends and home life begins and actually again for a lot of us working remotely that's become increasingly hard during this time. So sometimes it's useful to check in and say are those basic needs for me for my well-being being met right now and actually if they're not what are the practical things that I might be able to do to get back some of that control around those things. 
The second layer, again, we're talking about whole population needing some sort of social support in order to maintain good well-being. And again, that's been incredibly hard during the pandemic. So I know a lot of you watching today probably work remotely a lot of the time, but you might also work from a co-working space every so often. You might uh, have your own office that you go into and see other people, for example. And a lot of those normal social contacts, relationships, conferences, learning events, networking events have all stopped. They're, you're just not able to do them. And that removes that whole layer of social support for work. So the only people you have to go to are your friends and family. And do they understand what's going on for you at work? Do they bring the same perspective as those people in the same industry or the same team would have done to you before? Probably not. So thinking about ways that we can uh, re-establish some of those social supports with, uh, with work colleagues or people in the same industries and the same teams as, as us, again, is really important. It's not going to be the same way and it might not be as great as it was before, but the things that you can do that will add uh, some sort of social support. And then starting to move up that triangle is really where it's thinking about, do I need to take some different action? So roughly we're saying about a third of the population through COVID might need uh, some psychosocial support. And psychosocial support is, um, I suppose, the, the help that we get that helps us psychologically from our peers, from our friends, from our support networks. So it's not just having those people there, but it's having the people that you trust where you can speak very honestly about the impact on your sort of mental or physical well-being, where you know that you'll be listened to, you'll be heard. And actually, if it's somebody like minded, they might share something that they've done that's helpful for them as well. And so to give you an example of that, it's one of the things that's most important um, in the British Army when people have been away. So, for example, serving uh, in Afghanistan, what they recognise is actually outside support is not very helpful for soldiers, but peer to peer support is incredibly helpful. So to sit down with somebody who's been through what you've been through and talk about the impact on you does a lot more for you sometimes than speaking to a stranger about those things. Um, so again, that's something that we can all adapt into, into our lives in some way or another. Somebody that understands maybe your work or your, your particular challenges and being able to create that space just to talk through those things and have those feelings validated, really. Actually, it's normal to feel very angry. It's normal to feel very guilty. There's lots of emotion at the moment in response to this really unprecedented event. But talking that through with somebody can be very useful. And then for a small percentage of the population, and again, a small percentage of national health staff, but also for the general health population, we expect to see we'll need some sort of proper psychological intervention in response to COVID. So we will expect to see people suffering with depression, with anxiety, with post-traumatic stress, particularly maybe people that have been exposed to it. Um, and that might not necessarily mean that they work in health or care. It could be that a family member has been very poorly, for example. But that sort of trauma that might develop, not right now, but a year down the line, two years down the line, people might start to feel the impact of that. And we know from other events like terrorist events in this country that we've had before, that very often we see those, uh, those sort of deeper psychological traumas manifest a few years in. So we're prepared for that, if you like, within the NHS. But, uh, and from a general health population, we're, we're planning for that as well, to see mental health referrals go up. But one of the things that is really important is that people ask for that support when they need it. And actually, the longer something like that goes without somebody saying, actually, that psychosocial support for me is not enough. I need to speak to somebody you know, that's really qualified to help me. Uh, that helps you know, everybody to, to get better quicker. And it also helps the systems, the healthcare systems, to respond and understand what's going on as well. And that can be very hard, particularly if you've not been in a frontline role or maybe you've not lost somebody to COVID, but actually you feel like it's had a big effect on your mental health. There's something about being able to raise your hand and say, I don't need to be the person that was right at the front of the pandemic to have experienced something that that's, uh, you know, made me have some sort of mental health need. Uh, and that might be because of a pre-existing uh, condition. You may have suffered from something like that in the past. And actually, COVID is simply a trigger to bring it back. So these are the types of things from a psychological perspective where I work at the moment that we're working through and we're talking about how might we see and spot some of that and how might we support people to, to seek help early. Okay. 
So I just wanted to touch on three areas today. You'll see on this slide, there's more blank uh, shapes around there. But I just wanted to, to touch on three things that as we move out of the first active phase of COVID um, and into what some people are calling recovery, uh, which I'd say uh, very lightly at, at this stage, um, some things that are really helpful to, to consider, and they're all interlinked, to be honest. Um, so their recovery, so thinking about your own, be it individual, team, business recovery plan, rest, which is a bit that we normally all skip, and then resilience. So how do we actually grow from this experience that we've had? Um, and if we do feel that our mental health has been affected in some way, what can we learn about ourselves and build in that's helpful for the future as we move forward as well? So we'll start with re recovery um, and it was quite easy to find this image and hopefully it might resonate with with people um, so this is a this is a little bit of a, a picture if you like of what it might feel like to be working living doing childcare, being a teacher all the other things that people might have had to do during the pandemic at the same time um, and i'm sure we've all seen the clips uh, on the news of, of various people and experts trying to give an expert a uh, uh, interview to somebody on the national news and be interrupted by their child asking for a biscuit or uh, wanting some attention so we weren't set up at work to have these types of things happen and I think it just shows you that the situation that we're in at the moment is not sustainable so you might normally work from home remotely all the time that might be what you do but you might not always have your children there and be expected to be their teacher as well or you might not have had all your social connections where you'd normally pop out for a coffee you know, stripped away from you as well. So everybody in some way is probably having a bit of a different experience to what they would normally have at work. Even if you feel, well, actually, I'm quite well set up. I've got the tools I need. I've got the space I need. Something will be different from you. And obviously, we're all consuming the news from the media every day as well. So we are being affected. Um, and even for uh, communications experts, I don't think any of us are designed to be on video calls and conferences eight hours a day back to back without many breaks um, and this is something that we're we're hearing and seeing a lot of at the moment so there are lots of research studies right now being done into uh, zoom fatigue and the impact of uh, having your social connections cut and only talking about people as I'm doing today through video. Um, but what we do know already is that we weren't designed to do it and actually it can have a real impact on people's energy, on their sleep, um, on their ability to connect with people after a day full of uh, online meetings to then go and connect with people in person is actually really hard. Um, and I heard a, a sort of metaphor the other day that's really stuck with me around imagine kind of going into your local bar and seeing your mum, your partner, your son's teacher, uh, your ex-football coach, uh, somebody that you knew 10 years ago, a friend, all in the same place and having to hold a conversation with them all at the same time. You know, in some ways, a work day might look like that for people at the moment. They're balancing all sorts of different things with no boundaries, no being able to shut the door. Actually, everything's coming at you. Um, and that can have a real impact on our mental well-being. And it can happen quite quickly. And I think a lot of us have experienced that in some way during the last few months. So Monday, you're feeling fine. Tuesday, you feel a little bit tired. Wednesday, all of a sudden, you can't cope with the basic things that you might normally do do without feeling either really emotional or actually your brain just not catching up and being where you need to be and one of the things talking to psychology colleagues where I work is just realizing that that is completely normal um, and not feeling guilt not feeling pressure but knowing that that is a very normal response to being in a pandemic in a real crisis situation something that none of us have experienced before and actually it, there's no need to medicalize it that isn't depression that isn't anxiety that is just the response to the the pressure that's being put on all of us at the moment and sometimes just acknowledging that and giving yourself a bit of space to say hang on what are all the different things that I'm dealing with right now can be useful so in a very practical sense sometimes listing all of those things where boundaries have crossed or or extra challenges that you might not normally have to deal with and seeing just how much you might be managing at the moment can have quite a positive effect on your well-being and accepting of the fact that 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 nobody's built to deal with all of those things for a sustained amount of time um, it's also useful to think about the things that are having the biggest effect on your ability to concentrate on your energy on your focus and really you know 
taking a little bit of time to take a check of what have you flexed and what have you changed that's worked and what have you changed that really hasn't worked. So again, to give you a really practical example for me, um, on particular days of the week at work, the way meetings had been set up, I was running from one meeting into another meeting into another meeting and getting to about two o'clock in the afternoon without standing up. Um, and very quickly, not only was that having an impact on me physically, but it was also having an impact on me mentally as well. My ability to concentrate had gone out the window by two o'clock. And I thought, well, all I've been doing is sitting and talking to people. But actually, you know, that, that really does impact on my ability to then deep dive into a piece of really technical work and concentrate and create something that's coherent that other people might be able to read and make sense of. Um, so just checking in with yourself and thinking, what are the things that, that I notice about my daily routine that help? And what are the things that have really got in the way? And when's my best time to do focus work? And when's my best time to do meetings or, or catch ups with people as well? And thinking about actually that's my time and I can control it a little bit. But again, sometimes it's easy to allow other things to, to control our time as well. So they're just some thoughts around what we're calling, I suppose, recovery at work at the moment so just checking in on the things that have been really different for you and the things that you actually need to just take a little bit of time to recover from so whether it be children whether it be caring responsibilities whether it's your workload has suddenly increased massively because everybody wants your support is realizing that, that that isn't your your normal work day and your normal work time so moving on the second one, uh, just briefly, as, as I spoke about, is the one that we often skip. So rest and play. It's gone backwards. Um, so I pulled out this quote from uh, Brené Brown, the author that I love anyway. Um, it takes courage to say yes to rest and play in a culture where exhaustion is seen as a status symbol. So for many people, and particularly I know in the technology and the communications industry, there is a culture of saying, I'm so busy, I'm so amazingly busy at the moment as, as some kind of status symbol. And actually it can be hard to say, do you know what, I'm not that busy because I say no to work that impacts on me and, and means that I don't have enough time to rest or do the things that I enjoy. Um, and actually we're not used to saying that sometimes. Um, but where this becomes really important during a, a, um, a time like COVID, has been that actually not taking rest can have a massive detrimental effect on our health quite quickly. And not just our mental health, but our physical health as well. And actually for a lot of us that might be working differently, working different times, we're all gonna have days that feel really difficult to get over. And that's part of the letting go of our old ways of working that we used to have. Like I say, stepping out for a coffee, seeing a friend in a co-working space, whatever that might have been, not having those things in a way we're, we're kind of grieving for them a little bit and social contact with family and friends as well. So we're all going to have a day where we get up and feel horrible. And that's just part of change. And one of the most powerful things, I suppose, is knowing that you can't skip that. You're going to have a few days where you feel like that. And they probably won't be the same days as your friends and family or the people that you might be having meetings with. They might be having a great day that day and then a terrible day the next day as well. But one of the most useful things we can do during that time is connect back to rest and play. So rest being quality time away from work where you switch off and you're not connected um, to your work. And play being things that you really enjoy, that give you energy, um, that, that take you to a different space mentally and emotionally from what you might be experiencing uh, at work or, or at home as well. And the more we do that, the better we are when we step back into work. So it's recognising actually to be really productive during this time. I need to take more rest than I normally take and I need to do more of the things that I really enjoy than I normally do to address that balance of the impact of being in a, in a really stressful time. And I need to realize my triggers. So who for me is going to be the person that says, oh, you're not at your best today, or you're not behaving very well today. Who is that person? Um, and how do they get through to you to say, actually, you probably need to take a break or you need to go and do something else this afternoon and, and step away from that. And again, not having the normal people around us, that can be more challenging. But thinking about, is there somebody maybe that I work with or I know well, that I can check in on and say, you know, how are you feeling today? Can have a massive uh, benefit to, to recognizing that. 
And the other thing to consider is, is triggers and, and, and habits that you can build back in. So if you know that if you watch something really late at night, it then takes you an hour to unwind and that's having a negative impact, bringing all of that forward and having that time in the evening where you switch off and you do some relaxing activities um, instead. Again, you know that they only happen those things if we take the conscious decision to do them. So we can read them in the 10 top tips article to, to looking after your mental health. But actually, when we do them, that they do have a difference as well. I'm just gonna move. And then lastly, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, resilience uh, to, to kind of finish up really. So this image for me is really powerful. So something bad's happened to that tree that you can see there. Um, but actually, there's a whole piece of new life and, and growth there as well. And the term resilience, I think, is one of those terms that's being banded about at the moment. Kind of how well you move forward after COVID depends on how resilient you are as a business, as an individual. Resilience has only been used, you know, for the last sort of 30, 50 years to talk about work and systems and people that either go through something very negative and manage to survive or go through some sort of huge change and actually manage to grow from it or change and uh, be agile and adapt and do something different. Um, but we've been talking about it in psychology for a lot longer than that. So the term uh, post-traumatic growth is used in psychology that when somebody goes through something really life-changing that might be incredibly traumatic and negative is most often when they really realise what matters to them in life and then they might take a completely different direction and actually thrive as a result of that. Um, and that can be a very positive way of reframing what we're all going through at the moment mentally and thinking, what am I learning about myself? What am I learning about my team, the people I work with? What am I learning about my business even that I can really take something from and build on? So what changes have we made during this time that actually are going to be really useful going forward? And what have we learned about ourselves, how we like to work, um, you know, new connections we might have been able to make during this time, different ways of communicating that we don't want to go back to the way that things were before. We actually want to take this forward and, and grow it in a different way. And you can apply that to yourself as an individual. You can apply it to a, a group of people that you might work with, but you can also apply it to very practically businesses, projects, pieces of work as well that have had to adapt and change during this time. And it allows you to tap into that growth mindset that's really good for our mental health. So rather than focusing on the, the things we can't control, um, the things that are obstacles in the way, we look at them in a different light through, you know, how do I overcome that? Or what have I learned through, through going through that? That opens up those creative pathways in the brain rather than becoming very stuck in, an, in a negative way of thinking that can spiral quite quickly. Um, and again, some of the questions that I'd use in terms of coaching with leaders through this time have been trying to take people back to that positive place. So what's really motivated you? What's the best day you've had during COVID and why? What's given you energy? What's been successful? Those types of questions that help people just to think about things in a different way when they're maybe feeling at their their lowest um, and to start to see some green shoots. Um, I think we'll all see that a lot of systems, businesses, uh, ways of working will adapt massively out of this and there will be some real, real positive changes that we don't go back to how things were before. We actually move forward in a different way, but it's remembering to, to apply that to yourself. And then lastly, I just wanted to share a couple of very practical things uh, with you, particularly if you might be managing or working within a team of people. Um, so the first of these is a model that we've developed where I work. Um, and rather than sharing the model so much, I wanted to share the concept of it. Um, so one of the things we got feedback from really early was that people at work find it very, very hard to have a conversation about their well-being. And it doesn't necessarily matter whether that's with their manager or with a peer at work. Instigating a conversation about how you're feeling and your well-being is not a very, I, I would say, British thing to do in a lot of contexts. It can be quite hard. Um, but actually, the more we do it, the better we get at it and the more normal it becomes. So we've used a really simple model to help people think about how would I have a conversation about my well-being if I feel like I'd like to, or if I want to know how someone else is feeling, how can I do that in a way that doesn't just sound like I'm saying, how are you and wanting to move on to the next thing on the agenda very quickly that we were going to talk about. Um, so we've used this model, we call it CARE. 
Um, and it's simply connecting people, asking people how they are, accepting the fact that we're all living and working through a really crazy time right now and that it's completely unprecedented and there isn't any right or wrong way to feel on a given day at the moment. And then reflecting. So again, you know, what can you control? What can you not control? How are you feeling? What do you do when you don't feel great? Those sorts of exploring the things that, that could make somebody's well-being better. And then lastly, finishing that conversation, empowering uh, yourself or the other person to think about, okay, so what am I going to do differently? If I know I felt rubbish for the last few weeks, what can I do to make me feel different? And am I actually going to do that or not? And you can do that to yourself. You can have that conversation with yourself sometimes, um, but it can be useful to connect with others and use that as a way of checking in with people a little bit more so than the how are you, the how are you really, and, and building a little bit of time for that. And then the very last thing before I finish up um, was just a few comments from um, Professor Amy Edmondson. Now, Amy Edmondson wrote a very famous book that has kind of come into its own during COVID called Teaming to Innovate um, and really looks at the most agile teams and why they're successful. Um, she's actually been asked to come over from Harvard and work with the NHS in the UK to look at how as a whole system the health service moves forward but there's three things that she's uh, uh, spoken about in terms of what you can do with your team and, and how to think about team dynamics during Covid um, and they're very practical so the first let go of the need to have all the answers nobody has all the answers right now um, and actually any answers that we do have today might not be the answers for things tomorrow either so just removing that pressure from yourself as a manager or leader of people uh, can be very useful making time to connect with others so actually you know not just thinking about the work but thinking about the connections because you're not going to bump into people in a corridor or you know out getting a coffee and have those types of social interactions so you have to build that time in for yourself and then very lastly um, and I don't think this is just for managers I think it's for everybody that uh, works with other people and, and is successful and happy um, being curious and welcoming curiosity from others so why is somebody doing something in a particular way why have they answered in the way they've answered when you've asked them how they are? What's really going on for people? And actually, the more curious we are, the more great ideas, but also the more uh, trust we build between each other to be very honest about how we're feeling and to, again, to pick up on those signs of stress early and do something about them. So be genuinely curious with others. Um, so that brings me to the end of, of everything I wanted to share with you today. Um, just got some details from me there at the end. So you can find me on LinkedIn or um, on Twitter if you've got any questions. Uh, but thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Natalie. That was really, really insightful. Um, pretty much everything in that talk, uh, I, throughout the whole talk, I was like, yep, yep, yep. That's like all of these different things that we just don't really think about and the fact that the fact that we've all had to change how we work um, not necessarily in, in processes but mentally um, I, I work from home uh, I've got an office in the garden um, but my wife and my son have been off of work and off of nursery and so loads of people say well how does that really impact you you're out in you're out in your office but it does it completely and utterly changes everything like the breaks that i take um the fact that we have lunch together the fact that i no longer get those five minutes of youtube here and there because like i'm working 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 and then i have lunch and then i'm working 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 that's just not how i used to work so the the pandemic covid19 has completely and utterly changed that because we're all working from home or if you were working from home already then um things are different and so yeah, I don't really want to talk too much uh, in in this uh, because people are going to find the Q&A far more insightful. Um, so head on over to riot.com.xyz. The link will be in the description below um, where we'll be having a live Q&A with Natalie um, where you'll be able to pose your questions um, and hopefully she'll be able to help you um, or point you in the right direction for any of that help. Um, so yeah, not much else to say other than say thank you to Natalie for taking the time, um, A, to record this session, and then B, to take um, time out of her busy schedule with the NHS 
um, to be able to uh, do that Q&A with us. So head on over to riot.comcon.xyz and we'll see you soon. Cheers. Don't go anywhere quite yet though. We've got to say thank you to all of our sponsors. With Without them, none of this would have even happened in the first place. So for our platinum sponsors, we've got Tulu, Boxbone and Ciara. For our gold sponsors, we've got the Matrix Foundation, Vonage, Sangoma, Telviva and Lowey. Our silver sponsors are Aptise, Pion, Telco Bridges with ProSBC, Avoxy, 8x8 with Jitsi, and Firstcom Europe. And we've also got community sponsors, QXIP and Cycle Systems. Without any of them, this would never have even happened. You wouldn't have had all of this free content on YouTube. So go say thank you to all of them. Go look at what they provide, what services they offer. Um, and have a have a conversation with them all um, over on Riot, riot.comcon.xyz. The link will be in the description below, along with links to all of our sponsors. You can go and watch um, preview videos from all of our gold sponsors right now over on YouTube. The links will be somewhere over here. Um, all I've got to say is thank you to all of our sponsors. Um, and I'll see you over on the Q&A shortly. Cheers.